I was thinking, it's, oh Lord God of my salvation, it should be kind of minor, kind of sad, you know, like when I cry out in your presence. I don't want to resolve it, so. Oh Lord God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence. Do I want to stay at the same chord? Yeah. With, you overwhelm me with your waves. I don't want to kind of feel like there's something languishing. Your wrath lies heavy upon you, and you overwhelm me with all of your ways. Psalm eighty eight. O oh Lord God, who delivers me. By day I cry out, and at night I pray before you. Listen to my prayer. Pay attention to my cry for help, for my life is filled with troubles, and I'm ready to enter Sheol. They treat me like those who descend into the grave. I am like a helpless man, adrift among the dead, like corpses lying in the grave, whom you remember no more. You place me in the lowest regions of the pit, in the dark places, in the watery depths. Your anger bears down on me and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You cause those who know me to keep their distance and make me an appalling sight to them. I am trapped and cannot get free. My eyes grow weak because of oppression. I call out to you, O oh Lord, all day long. I spread out my hands in prayer to you. Do you accomplish amazing things for the dead? Do the departed spirits rise up and give you thanks? Is your loyal love proclaimed in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of the dead? Are your amazing deeds experienced in the dark or your deliverance in the land of oblivion? As for me, I cry out to you, O Lord. In the morning, my prayers confront you. O Lord, why do you reject me and pay no attention to me? I'm oppressed and have been on the verge of death since my youth. I've been subjected to horrors and am numb with pain. Your anger overwhelms me and your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They join forces and encircle me. You cause my friends and neighbors to keep their distance. Those who know me leave me alone in the darkness. Psalm 88. This is a prayer of a person surrounded by darkness in the deepest state of depression, not even a hint of light getting through. In the Hebrew, the word darkness is the last word of this prayer. Psalm 88 is a prayer that ends with one word, darkness. Now, what kind of prayer has darkness as its last word? Isn't prayer supposed to be about fixing things? Isn't prayer supposed to be about light breaking through? Isn't prayer supposed to be about hope and making everything better? What is a prayer like this doing in the Bible? It starts with darkness. He says, you have put me in the darkest depths in verse 6. And then in the middle, he says, are your wonders known in the place of darkness? And there at the end, his summary is this. Darkness is my closest friend. And there's no resolve. It just ends in a place of darkness. And in a culture where we have been programmed to want a quick resolve, this is a difficult thing. I mean, I grew up watching the Brady Bunch and every problem was resolved in 30 minutes or less. And that's how we want life to work, a quick resolve. And sometimes God does work that way. Sometimes there is a quick intervention and a resolution and a rescue. In the last couple of weeks, the Psalms that we looked at on fear and anger, in both of those, it starts with these deep, dark, toxic emotions, but there is a moment of breakthrough and resolve, and then God's presence just melts the negativity, and there's this sense of peace and transcendence. It resolves. 
but not this psalm. The psalmist says, I'm just sitting in the dark with these unresolved issues. And that's exactly where some of you are. You're sitting in the dark and you have these unresolved issues. You're thinking, how am I going to fill in these blanks with it this dark in the room? And if I don't have my blanks filled in on my notes, I'm not going to sleep tonight. <laughs> Take a deep breath. That's going to be okay. In fact, we already filled in all the blanks, so that issue is resolved. But we do want you to sit in the dark today. And for all of us, to experience again the lack of resolution. Because that's a part of the human experience, and it's not hidden in the Psalms. This Psalm embodies it, that there are seasons when the one word to describe our prayers and to describe our soul is this word darkness, where we get down to these deep states of depression. It feels like total isolation, I personally struggled with depression since my late 20s. Starting around that time, I would get this annual cycle of depression. There's a label for it, seasonal affective disorder, where I would hit a few weeks, three or four weeks, near the end of winter, where uh, I, I would feel the darkness sort of just blanket me. And I would just muscle my way through. You know, just pull myself up by my own bootstraps and I'd gut my way through because I, I knew it, it'll break, it'll break. Never really looking any more deeply into the darkness, just trying to get out as quick as possible. And muscled my way through. To 2012, and there was a collision in that season of uh, terrible circumstances in our lives and in the lives of our closest friends. Uh, there was, I think, a fatigue from running from some unresolved wounds from my past. And then also I would come to find out uh, I was also fighting my own body chemistry. And all of those things collided and combined into a season of depression that was so much darker and so much longer. It was day after day. It wasn't just week after week. It was month after month after month, and there was one word, darkness. And what's interesting is I look back at the techniques I used to try to manage those shorter periods of darkness in my life, and I tried to just do those harder and faster, and they just didn't work. And as I look at the techniques I use to try to deal with my darkness, it's hauntingly familiar. It actually takes me back to my childhood. There are certain mechanisms I used to deal with my fear of the dark when I was a kid. And maybe these would be familiar to you. I was afraid in my room of basically two primary sources of fear. Okay, the, the first one was the boogeyman. Now, I had a closet and the closet was on a rail, and the rail was bent, so you could never close it all the way, and it was always cracked like an inch or two, and I could see it in my mind's eye as a kid that the boogeyman was in there at night, and he would squint at me, he would peek through with one eye. And he was just waiting until I fell asleep to burst out of the closet and grab me. And the other source of my fear in the dark were the monsters underneath my bed. And I knew they were down there. And if I let a limb sort of slip off, boom, you're going right under. And I had a technique to deal with these. Okay, one technique, I call it the leap. So the leap was this, in my kid's logic, maybe you remember this, there's a zone around the bed, like a reach zone. And if you stay out of that zone, you're safe. Now what's funny is I have this image of these horrible monsters, but apparently they have very short arms. <laughs> short arms, man, they can't reach very far. <laughs> so if you could just leap over the reach zone, you're good. Anyone else, did you do that? Right? And of course, the other technique I call the tuck, because everybody knows a blanket is like kryptonite to a monster. Anything covered up, you are safe. The leap and the tuck. And those childish defense mechanisms, those are the same things I used to try to deal with my depression in those shorter seasons. I tried to tuck it, find a blanket to put over it, so no one could see it. And for me, the particular way that I tucked it was through achievement. You know, if I could get enough gold medals, get enough wins under my belt, 
enough accolades and affirmation, well, that would cover up the darkness. And when I hit that dark season, what was interesting is I was having some what you might call peak uh, achievements. If you look at uh, being a pastor as a career to be managed towards success, which I really don't, but if you do, there are certain peak experiences. And I hit some of those during that dark season. One of them, I, I got a book deal and I, I got published with the very publisher I wanted to be published with, the number one choice for me. And it was in the series of books that I really wanted my book to be in because some of my heroes had written books in that series. At the same time, I was invited to, to speak at one of the largest gatherings of church planners in America, in the West, and they invited me to speak on the main stage. These are peak experiences, but my darkness was so deep that these you know, career-long achievements that were meant to be the, you know, this sort of transcendent experience, both of them were just empty. And the darkness and the depression was so deep that neither one of them worked successfully, it didn't tuck anything. It didn't blanket up the darkness, which made actually my darkness go deeper. The other one is the leap. And the leap is this, you know what? I may have these issues back here, but I'm strong enough just to leap over them or to leap away from them. And the person who helped me understand this is a good friend of mine named Todd, who was a friend of a friend and we met in that season and he's one of these guys that I immediately had a lot of affinity with. And he, he could see what was going on with me because he had been through similar territory. And he began to share his story with me. And when I met Todd, he, he had actually started and sold two businesses already. He was very successful. He had started a third business. He was semi-retired. He didn't need the money. He just did it because he had this entrepreneur bug, and it was fun for him. And so his life was kind of slowing down, but he started having this chronic jaw pain. He said, my jaw was killing me all day long. And finally, it wore him down enough. He went in to see the doctor, and the doctor said, you know what? Here's what's going on. You're grinding your teeth. So at night, he's sleeping like this. So the doc asked him the normal questions. Are you experiencing you know, a high level of stress at work, for example? And he was like, no, actually, I'm semi-retired. And kind of clicked through this list of things. And then the doctor hinted at a suggestion. He said, you know, sometimes very achievement, highly successful, highly competent people, when they slow down, things come up. And it might be good to go see a counselor, which he didn't like that idea at all. And he said it, it took him a while for the pain to wear him down, but eventually he did. And he said, what I began to understand was that because of the abuse of my father in my childhood, I developed a set of defense mechanisms that had made me extraordinarily successful in the marketplace. But they were literally destroying my soul, destroying my marriage, and destroying my kids. And it took jaw pain. It took me slowing down and, and my defenses started to crumble. And that's how it came out for him. He was grinding his teeth. He couldn't, he couldn't stop. And he said to me, basically, Rob, I, I thought I was strong enough to leap over all that stuff, that it was resolved, it was done, that I learned to deal with it. But I realized I was going to have to go back to go forward. And I think you're going to have to go back to go forward and there come seasons of darkness where our, our management tools that we've used, our leaping and our tucking, we realize they are not going to be enough. And Psalm 88 is for the people who are experiencing that. Who are sitting in the darkness and they're asking God, what can you do? God, are you hiding from me in this darkness? And I want to make a few observations from Psalm 88 about seasons of depression and darkness. Seasons of depression and darkness, first of all, we need to recognize that they can be relentless regardless of prayer. Sometimes there is what I would call a surface version of Christianity that goes something like this. Just pray and it will make things better. Just pray and keep hoping and keep believing and you'll see God break through. 
There's this superficial expression of the gospel that it is a solution to make everything better. That if you really believe that your journey, your spiritual sojourn will be this sort of seamless climb up and to the right. And if you're praying and believing and obeying and it doesn't get better, then there's this sense of shame because that means something must be wrong with your faith. You must not really be believing. You must not really trust God. And you see a lot of preachers and they peddle this. All day, you can pick it up on any television station. It's on the bestsellers list. And, and there's this sense if I just pray right, believe right, and do right, everything should get better. And see what this psalm tells you is sometimes you can pray and pray and pray and do what you ought to do and call out to God and believe in God and you're still absolutely plunged into darkness and depression. The psalmist says this, he starts out with this confession of faith. Oh Lord, the God who saves me. In other words, I'm a believer. I trust you, God, as my savior. But he's saying in my heart, I have no sense of your presence, God. In fact, it feels like your wrath is against me. It feels like you're angry at me. It feels like you're destroying me. It feels like you've abandoned and rejected me and maybe no one has ever been honest with you. But you can trust God for your life and as your savior and still have to go through very long seasons where you have no sense of the presence of God. This extended period of darkness is such a common experience for earnest God seekers and God trusters that it's actually been given a name, a dark night of the soul. This phrase, dark night of the soul, it's, it's a diagnostic tool. Just like with mental health, the National Institute of Mental Health every year puts out the DSM. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And it's meant to be a tool for mental health professionals to look at clusters of symptoms in people's lives and give it a name so that we know what we're dealing with and we create a pathway forward towards healing. And there's some controversy about labeling theory. Some people are for it, some people are against it, and there's certain boundaries to its helpfulness. But nonetheless, for many people, it's been a healing thing to know the name of the thing that they're battling, to know that others have been through this pathway, that there are therapies, that there are pathways forward. And interestingly enough, the church has a similar role when it comes to the care of the human soul. And in, in our 2,000 years of history, there are great ancient researchers who have begun to diagnose certain conditions of the soul. And Dark Night of the Soul, it's a diagnostic tool, a way of naming something so that you will know you're not alone, that you will know there are certain spiritual therapies, that there is a way forward. And you can go back and read the work of these ancient researchers, and they've been profoundly helpful to me. You can jump back to the 16th century, to St. John of the Cross, who wrote with incredible brilliance about the dark night of the soul, or to the 14th century, to a spiritual classic called The Cloud of Unknowing. You can jump all the way back to the 6th century, to Dionysus. The, the, these ancient researchers help us understand that we are not alone. That there's this experience called the dark night of the soul. And any serious spiritual sojourner should not be naive. This experience of God forsakenness is common and even necessary for our own development. And when you come into the dark night of the soul, you need to know that that sense of God forsakenness, you are now in the company of the ancient faith of people like Moses and Elijah and Jesus himself. When you are in the dark night of the soul, you are now walking with the brightest lights in the history of the church, with companions like Martin Luther, the catalyst for the Reformation, who wrote extensively about his depression, or Charles Spurgeon, considered widely by many one of the best communicators in the history of the church. He's called the Prince of Preachers, and he would go into dark clouds of depression and unknowing. Or people like Mother Teresa, Here's a quote that you've probably not heard from Mother Teresa. I don't think this one's probably going to go viral. Listen to her words. I am told God lives in me, and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. 
This is from Mother Teresa's personal journals. In 2007, a series of those journal entries to her spiritual advisors, they were released. And for the most part, these letters, she never intended to have become public. In fact, she wanted them to be destroyed because they chronicled the agonizingly long season of depression and darkness and a sense of God-forsakenness that existed and reoccurred during much of her working life. And when I read these letters from Mother Teresa, it's comforting to me. It tells me I'm not alone in the darkness. And I think these letters, again, they, they uh, pop this balloon of superficiality. They help us see that any kind of characterization of Mother Teresa, some simple, pious saint who just walks on the clouds with Jesus singing, I'm walking on sunshine. Whoa, and does it feel good? It's not being honest. You know, you read her journals, and you know what you're going to find out? That she had seasons of felt communion with Jesus that were transcendent. They, in fact, were so profound that they launched one of the greatest movements of charity in modern history. But she will also tell you about times of darkness and a sense of God forsakenness that is so deep. And I just want to say, if you're in the darkness, you're not alone. You're in good company. The company of Moses and Elijah and Jesus and, and all the brightest lights in the history of the church. Next, Another observation, seasons of darkness and depression can reveal the depth of God's grace. In fact, there are some ways that we can only comprehend the amazing and amazing grace by going way down deep into the darkness. And again, we see the depth of that in this psalm. There's no editing here of this prayer. He's not trying to control his temper or his tone at all. Look at his words again that we read earlier. Do you show your wonders to the dead? To those, do those who are dead rise up and praise you? You've got to imagine his tone of voice here. Is your love declared in the grave? Hmm? Your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness? Or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? Here's my take on this passage. He is cross-examining God. He's putting God on the witness stand, and he's prosecuting him. He's saying, God, I would love to show off your wonders. I, I want to praise you. I'd love to talk about your love and your faithfulness and be able to tell other people about it, but you're not answering me, and I'm ticked off. He's basically saying, you have not been there for me, God. He's not speaking deferentially. He's not speaking reverently. Many would say he's speaking blasphemy. He has all these Images of God attacking him and turning people against him and sending wave after wave of pain and terror, he says. You gotta remember when you read the Psalms, th this is the emotional outpouring of a person's soul. Just because you read it doesn't mean it's theologically correct. This is blasphemy. And what does it mean that there's a blasphemous prayer in the middle of the Bible? Well, listen to the words of Derek Kinder in his commentary on the Psalms. The very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding. He knows how we speak when we are desperate. The very presence of this blasphemous prayer in the Psalter tells us so much about who our God is. He doesn't censor these prayers. He doesn't take them out. He doesn't say, oh, I don't, I don't want to be associated with people who pray like that, blasphemous, broken people. In fact, you can make a strong case from the Bible that the people who were closest with God were the people who argued with him the most, the people who took him to task. And God is saying this. He's saying, I'm not your God because you'll put a happy face on it every morning. I'm not your God because you say everything just right and you do everything just right. I'm not your God because you always use the right cliches and the phrases and speak reverentially about your faith. I'm your God because I am a God of grace. And guess what? I can take it. My shoulders are big. So let it up and out. 
You know, when I went into my journey into the darkness that went on for about a year and a half, one of the things that happened to me is I went down into the basement of my soul. And I thought it was pretty well cleaned out and pretty well organized, but I discovered I had built a false wall in there. And on the other side of the false wall was a lot of unforgiveness and rage and hate and actually really blasphemous ideas about God. And, and, and you know what? You know what was something? Guess who wasn't surprised? God. He wasn't like, whoa, where have you been hiding all that stuff? I had no idea that was going on. Guess who was the one who was clueless, right? And it was Jesus who was the one who walked me down there and said, are you ready to tear this wall down? I've been waiting. Because the monsters that are over there, guess what? I'm stronger. I got you. My grace, it's way bigger. My grace is way wider. Are you ready? Let's get the sledgehammer and get to work. And you can... Remember this one. See, the revealing of the feeling is often the beginning of the healing. And God can't heal it if we won't reveal it to him. And some of you in this room, you're editing your prayers because you feel like you have to to maintain some kind of image for yourself or for someone else or for God. And it's a lie, you don't. If you're editing your prayers, if you're editing your life, if you're leaping and tucking, you are missing the personal experience of amazing and amazing grace. And Brian talked about it last week. We have to turn that dark side of our moon toward the light of God's grace and get the toxicity up and out. Get it into the light of God's grace. We got to get it up and out in front of a trusted friend in a safe wise, trusted community. And for many of us, we would benefit from getting it up and out in front of a counselor. I know that's been tremendously healing for me. I met with my counselor this week. Because you know what? A lot of us are running from these scripts that were literally just burned into our brains that have, again, twisted images about who God is and how life works and who we are and what relationships are like. And it was burned into us over many, many, many years. And what Jesus wants to do through his Holy Spirit and through the power of his word and through a community of people is bring us through a lifelong process of what the Bible calls repentance. In other words, metanoia. We need to change the way we see God and ourselves in the world. And that's not something that gets fixed in 15 minutes in a sitcom with a nice bow on the top at the end. It's a lifelong, deep, intimate relationship with God, living in community where others will tell us the truth and not judge us and love us as we are, even when we put the crap out in front of them. And we need to look at all the different dimensions. There's physical dimensions. You know, there's serotonin, serotonin and dopamine, and these things can, these chemicals can get imbalanced in your brain, and you, you might need some kind of pharmaceutical help because otherwise you're trying to work through this stuff with an arm tied behind your back. You know, there's, there's psychological and, and mental tools that have been developed through scientific research and, and they're, they've been proven to be helpful and there's also spiritual tools. We also need to look at our circumstances. Some of us have allowed this very kind of defeating set of environments to, to push us down and we need to look at changing that. It's, it's multidimensional. It's a journey. It's a process. And God wants to lead you through it. And here's why. Because seasons of darkness and depression can be redeemed. It doesn't have to be the end of your story. Now, when you're in the darkness, it feels like it's final. It feels absolute. And that's what the psalmist felt. He felt like, okay, this is complete. God's wrath is on me. I've been abandoned. There's no purpose for me. And his darkness felt absolute and permanent. But he was wrong. And you might feel like your darkness is absolute and permanent. But I'm telling you, you are wrong. And how do I know the psalmist is wrong about this? Well, here's how I know. I can look at his story. And he thought this was the final chapter of his story, but it wasn't the final chapter of his story. How do I know that? 
Well, if you pay close attention at the Psalms, you'll see that there's a title for each one of the Psalms. And, and then it will list the name of the author or the songwriter. And you can see, if you look at Psalm 88, who wrote this song. It's a song, a psalm written by the Korites for the music director. And who was it written by? By He-Man. <laughs> Anyone having a flashback? <laughs> I have the power! It's not that He-Man. No, we know more about He-Man from 1 Chronicles chapter 6 in the Bible, which is one of the the books that chronicles the history of Israel. And He-Man was this leader of something called the Korite Guild. It was a collective of artists and musicians and poets. And this psalm is from the Korite Guild. Now think about it. This is an awesome name. I, I love 80s metal music. This would be an awesome name for an 80s heavy metal band. You know, He-Man and the Korite Guild. That is sweet. And by some weird twist of fate, if you want to find the Korite Guild Psalms, they are in the 40s, not the 1940s, but the 40s of the Psalms. And get this, also in the 80s. Some of you will get that later. So let me ask you to think about this. That means He-Man helped write the greatest psalms in the Psalter. That means He-Man produced some of the greatest artistry in the history of the world. Do you know what that means? Because of his darkness, his darkness was turned into art that has literally helped millions, probably billions of people now, from his point of view, his darkness was total. There was no purpose in it. God had abandoned him, but he was wrong. That darkness turned him into a diamond, into an artist who would become a channel for healing for literally billions of people. Do you think from the chair he was sitting in that he man knew that we would actually today in Kansas City with thousands of people be gathering to talk about his art and that for some of us right now, just in the last 30 minutes, it's become like a balm for us. Oh my word, he could not see that from the chair he was sitting in then, but I tell you, he can see it now. And God was with him, and he thought it was absolute and total and permanent, his darkness, but it wasn't. It was just apparent. It was just subjective. And here's the big idea for today, and I want you to just hold this in your mind this week. We all experience seasons where it feels like darkness is the final word. But from the light of eternity, we will know that our good and God's goodness has the final word. You know, the final word in Psalm 88 is darkness. We've talked about that. And I can't help but think of someone else. When I think of prayers about God forsakenness that happen in the darkness, I can't help but think of someone else. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came down from over all the land. And at the ninth hour, Jesus Christ on the cross cried out, My God, my God, why have you turned your face from me? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus went into the ultimate darkness. Jesus is the full revelation of the face of God to us. And what does Jesus tell us about God? That God is not watching from a distance. That God has not abandoned us. That God has stepped down into our darkness. That he is in solidarity with us. And that Jesus went into an ultimate darkness that none of us in this room will ever comprehend. And the reason he went into that ultimate darkness is for our redemption. Jesus entered the ultimate darkness so our darkness can be turned toward redemption. And if Jesus didn't abandon you in the ultimate darkness, he will not abandon you now. And if we turn our whole hearts to him, God will write a story in us as we engage him with our whole heart and our soul. And we might not be able to see it from the chair we're sitting in now, but we will see it one day. And listen to these words from the same theologian. 
This darkness can happen to a believer, this psalm says. It doesn't mean you're lost. This darkness can happen to someone who does not deserve it. After all, it happened to Jesus. That doesn't mean you've strayed. This darkness can happen at any time as long as this world lasts because only in the next will things be done away with. This darkness can happen without you knowing why, but there are answers, there is a purpose, and eventually you will know it. And now we're going to end with another psalm, a song. And it's a song that says, I am not alone. And in your darkness, you are not alone. And this song is a confession of faith from the darkness. And for some of you, you will hear these words. And it will give lift to a prayer that is in your soul. There will be a confirmation there. And I invite you just to turn that darkness and lift it to him. But for some of you, you'll hear these words this morning. And you're just not there right now. There won't be a confirmation in your soul yet because it's unresolved. But no, that's okay too. And that in that lack of resolve, God is with you. Let's make this song our prayer.
You're not alone. One of the things that's been amazing in this series on the Psalms is there's been an extraordinary amount of response. People are having the courage to step up and say, you know, my anxiety, my anger, or my depression. I want to take a step. I don't want it to let me be isolated anymore. And there's just been an extraordinary amount of response, people letting God just get loose in their souls in a really deep way. And I want you to know one of the ways that God makes his presence most tangible is through his people. Fear and anger and depression can be so isolating. But here, this is a safe community. Guess what? All we got in this room is a bunch of broken people. And this is a community where you can step out and not be judged and find a safe place where others will say, yeah, me too. Maybe today you can step forward and, and partner with someone. They would just love to pray with you. Well, we also have these groups. They're called lifelines. And they're for people who come together around a similar affinity, maybe a certain particular hurt or habit or hang up maybe in an addiction or it's grief or divorce or there, there's a number of different options and lots of folks have been stepping into those communities over the last few weeks. If you want more information about that, you can search that online or stop in at the Connection Center. We also have licensed therapists that are part of the West Side community and for some of us that would be the most courageous thing we could do is step out and begin that process, that, that conversation. I want to encourage you to do that. I also want to let you know, next week is a psalm about celebration. Whew, finally. <laughs> and we're going to celebrate communion together. And uh, Brian Johnson's going to be teaching, and it is going to rock. In other words, you get to see the beard. It's going to be really fun. So stand up with me, and let me say this prayer before we go. Receive this blessing. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. His name is Emmanuel. That means God with us. And all God's people said, amen. Go in grace and peace.